I'm Batman. Easy, miss. I've got you. You... you've got me? Who's got you? Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. I'm a doctor. But probably not the one you expect. I'm Captain Kirk. Welcome everyone to a special Geek This Week presentation and this is the Doctor Who 6th Doctor and Companion panel from Pensacon 2023 at the Clark Family Cultural Center in downtown Pensacola. Sit back and watch as actors Colin Baker, the 6th Doctor, and Nicola Bryant, who played his companion, Perry Brown, talk about their respective careers and their time on Doctor Who, and much, much more. And when you're done watching this uh, video, please check out all the other great content on the Geek This Week YouTube channel, including panels from previous Pensacons, and much, much more. And thank you all for your support. Hope you enjoy the video. Thanks. Colin Baker and Nicola Bryan. <laughs> I was scared, but I didn't hide behind the sofa. 
I hid on the sofa mm -hmm. because we had a sofa that had legs, probably about this long. So the sofa was sort of on these elegant legs. But I was like, oh, the stork or the monster's hand or the, something mm -hmm. could come under the sofa. So Doctor Who had to be watched with feet up, <laughs> knees up <laughs> on the sofa. That was the way to watch Doctor Who. And sometimes it was a really scary episode. I did not want to get down from the sofa afterwards mm -hmm. to go and have our supper, our dinner, because I would be called and I didn't want to get put my feet down to run to the dining room. <coughs> not yet. <laughs> so, not yet. I'm not quite safe yet. So those are my childhood memories of Doctor Who. And I got into Doctor Who by being an American. <laughs> <laughs> in a musical called No 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 Net. Please don't ask me to sing any of it. <laughs> Would you sing some of it, please? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> and it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult musical. Um, and uh, do you want the long version or the short version? Oh, give me your version. Okay. Well, the long version is, it's a very difficult musical and in my drama school, this is the final year so we're doing our final productions, um, they only gave singing tutorials out each year and in the first year they gave out, you know, four or five to my group and they gave those to the people with the stunning voices who were obviously just going to go on and star in musicals. Um, I was sticking to Shakespeare and Chekhov, you know. And then the second year, they gave the singing tutorials to all the people who were like tone deaf, <laughs> so that they could become more musical. Um, not to do musical, but more musical as an act. And I didn't qualify in any of these departments. I never got a tutorial. So we'd done all the, the classics, we'd done some wonderful shows, but this was the final show before we'd all be left out uh, into the wilderness to discover whether or not we'd have a career. So this show was important, but I knew it was a musical, and because I didn't have tutorials, I would not get a role in this musical. I would be third bathing suit from the left in the background, because there's one swimming scene, a you know, beach scene in it. So I knew I was destined to play the chorus, but I was, at that time, secretly married, because I was secretly married before I was secretly married during Doctor Who, <laughs> because I got married in drama school. I was a baby. <laughs> and he was a Broadway star. And he had starred on Broadway, he'd done several shows, he had a wonderful voice. And when I came home, I went, oh, it's none of the net. And he went, forget about that. Forget it's a musical. If it was a straight play, which part would you want to play? I went, well, Annette. And I'd be perfect casting for Annette. He said, right, well, we've got two weeks. Let's practice. And I thought, I've got nothing to lose. No one expects anything from me. I have nothing to lose. I knew I could do all the, the dance audition, but... And because it was our final show, the principal of the school and all the teachers decided they would hire an outside director, because normally it was all in-house who would come in and audition us as though this was a proper audition. Mm -hmm. So in comes this director, I do my audition, I have nothing to lose, I sing my heart out, I dance my heart out, I act the little part and I go home and went, <laughs> well, I won't get it, but I did my best, mm -hmm. I had fun. I got the part. <laughs> Three that, you know, because he thought I was. 
was the only real American. <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether that says something about everyone else's accent. Um, Terry Carney was William Hartnell's step, what was his son in law? Son in law. Yeah, son in law. So the week after I left drama school, this thing arrived on his desk saying, we're looking for a new American companion in Doctor Who. Now being Doctor Who did look at it very carefully because he had this connection to it. And he thought, I've seen the perfect person. So he rang me up and I told him to get off the phone, stop playing silly <coughs> jokes because I thought it was a problem. <laughs> Because who rings you the week after drama school to say that? So I hung up and then he rang up again and he said, perhaps you'd like to write this number down and you can ring me back. And I said, no, that's okay, I believe you now. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, I'd like to put you up for this role of Perfect Gillian Brown, an American in Doctor Who. And I said, well, as you can probably hear, I'm not. He said, yes, but I thought you were. And I was with an American casting agent that day, and she thought you were too. <laughs> so, would you please go in and do that same voice and do the audition? And when you get it, yeah. like that, um, we'll tell them. And he said, and of course, if you get it, we'll take. I'll take you on into the agency. If you don't, then I'm not taking you on. So it wasn't even a. It was just this one opportunity. And so I auditioned, and I re-auditioned, and I re-auditioned, and I re-auditioned, I did like four auditions, as they were flying all the people in from the States and Canada. <laughs> and then they said, we'd love you to have a part, but you don't have an equity card, so we'll have to give it to our second choice. Mm. <laughs> and I thought, no, after all that. So I looked up the rules, of equity, and if you had a zero weeks card for being in, which you could have in those days, for doing light entertainment, I could then do the job, which is like having a provisional driving license. <laughs> so I, I wrote my own contracts, and I went out to clubs and pubs and said, please will you hire me to sing really badly in your club? <laughs> And a couple of people said, well, we don't really need a singer. I was like, yes, you do. Yes, you do. And um, it was two clubs that I did singing. And it was, it was terrible. But, but they paid me. And so I then took my contracts in and gave them to Equity. And Equity said, oh, we haven't got time to look at them this week. So then it meant I had to call up the BBC and say, I'm sorry, I haven't got my Equity card in time. I haven't got the job. So... Having said to equity, oh, okay. And then went, oh, come on, Nicola, put yourself together. I rang the back up and I said, I'm sorry, if you don't look at my contract this week, I'm going to lose this huge job. And if you mean, it means that I lose this incredibly big job, I'm gonna to go to the newspapers and tell them how the acting agency destroyed my acting career. <laughs> and so they said, Hold on a minute. <laughs> we'll call you back. 15 minutes later, we've looked at your contracts, you're in. <laughs> so that was a very long way around. And luckily, Colin's story's a lot shorter. <laughs> well, I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah, it's <laughs> between the jobs you're doing at the moment, so you're free to do it. And I said to him, oh, well, that means I'll never be the doctor. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, they never cast Doctor Who from an actor who's been in the show before, so I won't be doing it. He said, well, they're not going to ask you to do Doctor Who, are they? <laughs> <laughs> and I then a 
many times. <laughs> and he said, well, do you want to do it or not? I said, yes, okay, I'll do it. So I turned up to play Maxill in Ark of Infinity, and we rehearsed. And at the end of the rehearsal period, the producer and the cameraman and the scene people will come and watch a run through of the whole play, like the, like the dress rehearsal of the play, only in a room with marks on the floor for all the things that are supposed to be there. And they all step around like that, watching you, right in your eye line while you're doing it. Yeah. And we went all the way through. And at the end, John Nathan Turner, and it was the first time I'd met, met him, came over to me and said, What's this program called? I thought, doesn't know the name of his own program. <laughs> I said, Doctor Who. And he said, Oh, it's not called Maxill. <laughs> I said, What do you mean? And he said, Well, you're playing it as if you're the most important person in it. And I said, Yeah. <laughs> well, Maxill thinks he is. Yeah. Maxill thinks the doctor's an idiot. Maxwell thinks everyone's an idiot. <laughs> Maxwell is doing his job and he's doing it very well. And he said, can you just leave a little space for the camera uh, for Peter to appear in? Uh, I said, you mean tone down what I'm doing? And he said, you'd oblige me if you did. And I said, yeah, all right. And I did, and I played the three uh, episodes. I got out and we joked about it. Uh, and then a week later, the girl who was the floor manager got married and I got on really well with her, so she invited me. And my wife and I went to her wedding and John was there. And every now and then in life, the, the muse of something or other sprinkled stardust on you. <laughs> and unusually for someone who's grumpy like me, I was quite light-hearted and jokey. And John tells the story that he left with his partner saying, I found my new doctor. He told me that later on. Because a few months later, I got another phone call from this time from John Nathan Turner saying, hello. I said, oh, hello, how nice to hear from you. He said, can you pop in and see me next week and uh, for a chat? And I said, yeah, sure. Uh, and I said to my wife, because at that time I, I was already reasonably well known for another show I'd done called The Brothers. And I got regularly in the summer invited to go and open fates and things like that. You know, I cut this ribbon and go, blah, 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 enjoy yourself, bye. Um, <laughs> so I thought, oh, John wants me to open a fate in Brighton where he lived. So I went out to meet him and uh, we sat down and we had a glass of something that I went to eat. And he said, oh, oh Peter Davison's leaving the programme. I said, oh, oh, that's a shame. Who's taking over? He said, I hope you will. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's not what I expected. He said, uh, have a think about it. Um, I, I wanted to go, yes, 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 yes. Uh, and, uh, and he gave me a load of old tapes of all the other doctors. He said, come back, we'll have a meeting. Tell me how you'd like to play it. I said, okay. I went home and said, well, hours of uh, eight episodes or something with Patrick Chapman was very long, very good. And I watched them all and I came back and I said, well, it strikes me that this guy is an alien and isn't always going to behave in the way that I might, you might, anybody. There might be moments where you go, that's weird. Why did he do that? And the example I gave was he might step over a dead person to pick up a butterfly, his wing was broken. I get upset about the butterfly, because the dead guy was already dead, so you forget about him, but the butterfly wasn't. And things like that, you know, just odd reaction that singles him out as not being from planet Earth. And we chatted around, he said, yeah, I like, like what you're saying. Come up and meet the head of Ceres and Cereals. And I went up and said, Cereals, not the things you eat. Take me a breath. And I had been listening to the cricket on my radio as I was driving in. We went up to David Reed's office and he was sitting watching the cricket like this. And John Nathan Turner was not somebody who was remotely interested in sport. So he was a bit put out that 
the person who was meeting me wasn't really meeting me. And I came in and said, is, is Ian Bertham still batting? Yeah. And we sat down and watched cricket together, <laughs> which all perplexed in the background. And after watching cricket for 10 minutes with this man, he turned to me and said, you know what you're letting yourself in for, don't you? With Doctor Who, you're, you know, you're stuck with it for the rest of your life. And I went, yep. And he turned to John and said, he'll do. <laughs> Certainly of the classics, I didn't have to do a screen test, I wasn't up against anybody else, I was just offered it. And that is so liberating. Um, it meant when I arrived, I knew they wanted me, and I had to fight for it. Every other job I've had, I've had to go for two or three auditions, and nowadays you have to do record on your phone and send that, you don't get it. Um, but then, the best job I ever had was given to me on a plate by a man who I adored for that reason. John Nathan Turner, for me, was, we got on very well. We, we shared a common um, jaundiced eye of the world, if you like. And I still, every now and then, think, oh, I'd love to tell John that, and I've forgotten that he's no longer with us. Um, and I turned up to do a part which should have made me incredibly nervous. I wasn't at all. I was finally doing something I felt Yes, this is what I should be doing. So going along with that real quick, and then we'll get to some questions. Nicola, did you, when you came in the show, had Peter already said he was leaving at that point? Did you know you were going into another doctor? No, I had no idea. In fact, I found out by watching the news. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, it, was, it was a shock, it was a surprise, and I had thought they might tell me before they put it on the news. But they didn't. So, um, and I was kind of like, I was still in that finding my feet. Nervous girl coming out of drama school, big job. So I was thinking, oh, am I going to have found my feet before we start to, right. you know, have someone else? But as an actor, you have a different cast with every story. Um, change is a good thing in this, that sense, that you, you have a... Um, and so I, I wasn't, I wasn't worried. I was just kind of thinking, who's he going to be? What's he going to be like? Will we get on? And then it was Colin, <laughs> and I was, I was so lucky. Well, I think well, I was nervous because you know when you go into a castle, there's somebody who's been in it before. They know a lot more about it than you do. So uh, I was lucky. She was very good. She always knew my lines better than I did. <laughs> if I tried in rehearsal, she'd whisper them to me. She's very kind of you. Well, you guys did something they also really had never done in Doctor Who either, which is go right into your first story right off the regeneration. Usually they do that yeah. and then it goes to the next yeah, season. Yeah, yeah. So they had a chance to kind of check you guys out before they had to wait an hour long, you know. Well, I'm not sure the authors bothered him watching that sometimes. <laughs> um, it, it was a huge disadvantage for me because my first story involved me having regenerated badly and having been. Because when Peter became the Doctor, uh, he was carried around for the next four episodes <laughs> by his three companions because he was so exhausted, poor fellow, <laughs> by the that he, he, he wasn't kind of. Commentus at the beginning, when I suddenly so decided to have the opposite with me, that I would emerge from the cocoon, flying, shouting, screaming, mad, rendered balmy by the process, and th Brooklyn, Brooklyn, not Brooklyn, Brooklyn, my companion, uh, which was brave. It was very brave, and I approved of it because <clears throat> I've always thought the interesting characters are the ones you get wrong at the beginning. You think. I always use this, but it's Pride and Prejudice, if you've read it or watched it, all the way through you think Darcy is awful, but he's not. He's the only truly decent person in the story, uh, but he has a difficulty in showing it. And I'd be quite like that in fiction. Snape, if you like, in Harry Potter, you know, who wasn't, you know, the, the 
were the simply most unpleasant person in it. He was uh, he was troubled and but deep down loved. That was his problem. And I quite like the idea of discovering the doctor. Uh, but that one episode at the end of that series of Peters left them with only the last two lines of me going, I am a doctor whether you like it or not, and winking with a smile. Everything up to then had been me deranged. And then there were three months, four months, six months before the next series. So the, the general public, certainly in England, had all that time to think, I don't like that new doctor. <laughs> So it took me quite a while, and, and also the writers decided, I think the writers also, the, the story they are writing is the important bit, and then fit the Doctor and companion into it. And they all had latched onto that early bit, and me being unpleasant, the new pickering and whinging. And that persisted for so many episodes, and we eventually decided to play against it, didn't yeah. we? So that even though we said the right lines, we said them in a loving way rather than an unpleasant way. So gradually we nudged the relation with the two of us and my persona into an acceptable uh, area. But it took a long while and it's only a big finish. Um, the audios that have allowed me to really show old six in, in his true colours. Now, just quickly, um, when you went into big finish, is that, is that, did you get to do what you intended to do originally? Is that what you're doing now with the show? Yeah. Because so, even in the, the, your first season together, you can kind of tell toward the end, you know, Perry and the Doctor really care about each other a lot. Yeah. And the bickering is kind of like, you know, their fun thing to do. And then when you go to the second season, beginning of Travel with Time Lord, when you're in the mystery, was it mysterious? I'm having, yeah. Their relationship, you can see it. You can see they've had a lot of adventures together, they trust each other a lot, and, yeah. and the bickering is really more joking, and I guess we're playing it that way. But it was like, hey, the companions are clicking with the doctor, and it's great, and then the next episode, you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, what? So, um... <clears throat> and also, in the second story of the trial, there was all that stuff, is, is this really happening? Right. Going on. Um, and that bit with you on the rocks, yes. when I was torturing you, was I really? Was the Matrix lying? Um, was I pretending because I knew we were being watched? Um, or did it never happen at all? Um, and I asked the writer, uh, I asked the script editor, who asked the writer, and neither of them seemed to know. So I decided that the whole thing was a lie, that the Matrix was feeding this picture of me being horrible, and I made it so horrible that it was clearly not consistent with what was going before. So it could be seen to be a lie, but people were still confused. Well, I've always felt, even as a kid watching it, that when the master showed up, oh yeah, this is all crap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's something <laughs> yeah. else going on there. So, it's did all you crap when the master shows up? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I appreciate you talking about that. Let's go to some questions real quick. Yeah, now you can get up and look all over each other. <laughs> Who gets there first? Come on, come on, faster, faster. <laughs> My name is Justin. I'm here with my daughter Ella. She's the doctor, and I'm her companion. So, uh, thank you so much for your beautiful energy for being here. It's a dream come true for me. And I always thought the companion is the true hero of the story sometimes. Sir. Just like the hero of the story. Sir. Oh, because I'm deaf and stupid, I didn't know a word of that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I think it's exciting. It's exciting because we are slowly learning. Tiny whiny. <laughs> <laughs> we are slowly learning that doctors can be many things as well as the doctor. And there are all sorts of ancillary uh, offshoots of the programme where there's apparently the same person is in a different, I think the, the worlds of Marvel have taught us this, that you can have 17,000 parallel doctors all doing different things. And one of them <coughs> is the warrior doctor or the unnamed doctor. And it gives you a chance to basically um, remove the conventional doctor cassette, put in a new one and have a bit of fun. And I've, I've loved doing that. And I've loved the war doctor as well, because the war doctor is, is gritty and fun and you know, get down and dirty. I liked all that. You even got to bring Maxwell back at one point, didn't you? Has Maxwell been back? Yeah, I thought you played him in, in uh, one. Has he? <laughs> I liked him. I might be talking out of turn, but I swear I heard one. You were talking about your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been a Maxwell fan. Um, Hello. Hello there. Um, first, very much an honor for me to even be able to be up here. Thank you very much for being here. Pleasure. Um, kind of a two, two halfer. Um, first, what is your favorite project you've ever done that isn't Doctor Who? Because, for example, I saw you in a VHS tape of the BBC version of War and Peace opposite Sir Anthony Hopkins a long time ago. And despite the total lack of Russian accents, I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> so I was curious what what you both have enjoyed outside of Doctor Who. And then secondly, is there a role still out there that you would love to play, something that you haven't done yet in your career, that if you had your pick, your choice, that you would love to play? A role. A million roles out there that I still want to play. So, yeah, um, that's hard to pick um, one. Um, I think I'm past my Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, These days, you are never passing it. Oh, yes. They cast everything bizarrely and wonderfully now. So, yes. Um, <coughs> I can't, I, I don't know, I can't think of just like one particular role, though. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm probably still, I'm too old to play Lady Macbeth. Um, but many shapes. No, you're not. Okay. No. I, I would love to play that. Um, and parts that I have enjoyed playing, um, I got to play Zelda Fitzgerald in a three-hander, and I just love everything about F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I met the people who were doing it in an audition for a West End show, and, and I got the job in the West End, and I spoke to the guy who was going to be playing F. Scott Fitzgerald, and I said, oh, I would love to play and this was 20, 30, 20, 30 something years ago. I would love to play Zelda Fitzgerald in your play. And he went, ah, oh, well, it's already cast. And anyway, you're way too young because she, you've got a player from like 18 to 40 something. And I was in my 20s. And I was like, oh, but I know so much. And, and we, we sat and we had coffee afterwards. And I told him about my love and my passion. And then I got a phone call one night at about midnight. And he said, do you still want to play Zelda Fitzgerald? And I was like, what? Who? He said, I said, yes. And he said, well, we're on in 48 hours and our actress is ill. <laughs> <laughs> so I got in the car and I drove. I lived on, in Putney, which is on the outskirts of London, drove into the centre of London, picked up the script, drove back, cried as I read it because the script was and my husband was like, is it bad, darling? Is it really bad? I said, no, it's gorgeous, amazing. So then I had to just try and absorb, and luckily I could learn things quite quickly then, as much as I could. And the other two actors who were playing, one was playing F. Scott Fitzgerald, and the other was playing Ernest Hemingway, just said, if you've got the shape of the play, we'll just go with you. Apparently, I got one line wrong. I have no idea how I did that. I have no idea. How you got wrong? Yeah, I don't know how I got that wrong. It's terrible. <laughs> but and when they say that, I mean, like, not quite perfect. I got the gist of what I should have been saying at that point, but I didn't use the right line. And I think it was all the adrenaline of having the part that I wanted to play and 
playing it under those circumstances. And luckily it was a very smart director. He didn't overload me because it would have been really easy to have just <laughs> crumbled. And he was just like, well, where you move where you feel comfortable and the other actors will move around you. We've been doing it like this and there was, but yeah. But I got seen doing that job, then going in the West End to do another job, which gave me my following job. Mm -hmm. So, but not many people did see me because it was a small, Fringe production. I really thoroughly enjoyed doing that. What I like to play, it was, it's always been annoying that I never got to play Dumbledore. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have played Dumbledore. And having read the books long before they made uh, the, the films, I saw myself as Dumbledore. <laughs> but of course, they cast at a very starry level. So as soon as they all started, I realised that there was no room. David Tennant, yes, <laughs> as a young modern star, but an old fogey like me, um, slightly lower in the pecking order than uh, people like, I can't remember the names of the actors now, but who played, who played Dumbledore? Uh, Richard Harris, Nash Harrison, and then... Uh, I mean, Richard Harris is a film star. So yeah, that, I would love to have done that. Um, and there are lots of parts I think, oh, I'd love to play that, but I have to acknowledge that I am, well, I'm knocking on the door of 80 later this year, so um, the, the number of parts that I might be called upon to play are diminishing. But I have, a lot of the things that I've enjoyed the most have been theatre, and in the wake of playing Doctor Who, I was invited to play parts I wouldn't have been asked to do otherwise, First thing I did after leaving Who was a, a play in which I was playing twin brothers, one of whom was trying to kill the other. <laughs> you can see the difficulty in that. <laughs> and he succeeded. <laughs> but uh, that was called Corpse, and I did that for a year, and I loved every minute of it. And I saw you in it, you were wonderful. Oh, thank you, thank you. And I played Captain Terry Dennis in uh, Primus on Parade where I got to play a, a, a female, a, a male, a female entertainer. So I played um, Marlena Dietrich, Vera Lynn, um, Carmen Miranda, uh, and a couple of other ladies I can't remember now. Um, and I love working in drag. <laughs> and joyously, he was not supposed to be a great singer. So I could supply that very well. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I, I played Inspector Morse on stage, um, the only person to have done it since John Thor left us, bless him. Um, and I, I, I just last year played Sherlock Holmes with, um, yeah, I know, you see, I don't look like Sherlock Holmes, do I? But it was a, on stage, an audio production. So it was like watching actors in an audio studio recording Sherlock Holmes. So with all the microphones, people love the spot effects, you know, coconuts for horses and doors opening and closing and all that. And it went extremely well. And, and Terry Malloy uh, played my um, uh, Watson. So it, it, I'm doing it again next year. Uh, whether I will be asked to or able to play something dynamic in a play on stage in the future. I don't know. I'd give it a go, possibly. But maybe. Everyone else retires at 65. Actors, <laughs> we soldier on, don't we? Um, and of course, I've got Big Finish, and which I owe so much to, uh, because they've enabled me to make um, the Sixth Doctor the man he is now, rather than the one he was then. Um, uh, which I'm heads over heels grateful for. All right, next. Okay, one, it's an honor. <laughs> and second, what do you think of the new Doctor Who's and how they're played? Well, what I think of new Doctor Who, I think it's fantastic. I've loved every one of them. Uh, I think the best episode I've ever seen of Doctor Who was one of uh, Crystal Recklesen's. Um, the the, uh, the one that ends with uh, the Doctor dances and what's it called? Empty Child. 
And, uh, yeah, the end child, Dr. Dancers. I knew the program was back then because I'm a school governor, which is like a trustee. Uh, and I was in the school playground the day after, the Monday after it was first shown. And the children in the playground were going around saying, Are you my mummy? <laughs> Sent chills down my spine, and he had the best line ever. Everybody lives, he said, yes. in the second episode, and I, and it's just carried on in that tradition. And I adore. What's her name? Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, I've seen her. I adore <laughs> Julie Whittaker because she brought something new to the show. Joy. She brought joy. The joy when she was making her own. Um, Think of fresh yes. <laughs> 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 I never had a sonic so I don't know how long. But I, I was so cross with people, and there were some of you out there, I'm sure, <clears throat> who said the doctor can't be female. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why would the doctor change every little bit of his body except <laughs> <laughs> First off, thank you so much for coming out here. It's a tremendous honor to have you. And first off, uh, 
uh, funny for Nicola to mention the Fitzgeralds because their house is actually in my hometown and I visit it often. It's a beautiful place. But as an aspiring writer, of which as an aside, one of my protagonists is named Colin, if that is any indication as to whom I was inspired by when creating him, uh, I have come to realize that characters and their story arcs are more often than not symbolized by narrative concepts which can be summed up with words such as loss, vengeance, growth, betrayal, loyalty, hope, among other things. My question to the both of you is, in reflecting upon your own characters, what narrative concept do you believe most accurately represent their own story arcs, and how has that contributed to the overall narrative story of Doctor Who as a whole since then? Interpreter? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was the base notes, I can't hear them. Um, getting the gist of that is the ideas of character, you know, like their growth and their happiness and, and all that. Which trajectory was your character? It's basically that. What kind of, what kind of character were you, I guess? Oof. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think Perry had a tough life. Mm. Um, I think she was, um, ultimately I'd say she was a fighter and a survivor, um, but I think she was going to be sent a great deal of adversity. Um, and I think that's what makes her journey interesting, um, and so interesting that she ends up as a queen, <coughs> and as a warrior, and as many, many other characters. Um, and I'd say there's definitely a, a dark side to her journey, and I would say that also with her there's faith. There's a great deal of faith in the Doctor, and loyalty. I think. Uh, journey of loyalty because she decides that whatever he's going through, whatever he's done, she sticks with him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for anyone who's listened to The Widow's Assassin, you know how much he stuck with her. <laughs> how many of you have heard that? The yeah. Widow's Assassin? <laughs> when? Two. Well, if you want to know what they're, they're on the road. If you want to know what happened and how heroic the Doctor is, Big Finish covered that in that story so beautifully, and it follows on exactly from where we left the television series. So I think that covers. Does that sort of cover what you're looking for? Yes. For me, there have been there were five generations before me, and all of them had a story, and they'd all coalesced at that point into the Sixth Doctor. And for me, it's not like playing either a real character or a fictional character, where a certain amount of research can um, find out extra facts. All the extra facts that were known are there, the previous episodes. And that led me <coughs> to a point where the, the, the thing that mattered most to the Sixth Doctor was that wherever he was, when he left, he wanted things to be better or less worse by whatever means he could do without, without destroying anything impossible. That's why those lines of Eccleston's, everybody lives, so important. Because that's what the Doctor's about. And it, of course he's complex, and each regeneration of the Doctor <clears throat> can bring all sorts of additional things. But for me, I, I drew on myself, I drew on the past, and I drew all the words that were written in each script and shut them all together in a great big melting pot and learnt the lines. <laughs> um, that's about it, really. Um, it, it's kind of load the gun, point it and fire it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have basically time for one more question. It's Colin! Yes, and it's <laughs> you, Colin. <laughs> I'm glad you got your car going on the auto, Eric. So you've been waiting for it for a while. So my question is uh, about the brothers. At the end of season seven, you're kind of left on a cliffhanger. So if it were, if it were up to you, would you want Paul and Amy to get back together and be a big happy family, or would you have rather them eventually ended up in divorce? I didn't hear, of course. <laughs> 
The brothers. Yes. Yeah. Did there was a cliffhanger, right? Okay. At the end of season seven, the cliffhanger. Yeah, cliffhanger. Would you? Your character have been happier getting uh, staying married. Would you have wanted Paul to stay married to April? <laughs> or would you have wanted them to eventually got divorced? This is a brilliant question. <laughs> Nobody else in the room will have a clue about that. <laughs> I did a series of the 70s in Britain called The Brothers. When I was doing it, I voted the most hated man in Britain. <laughs> which was exactly 10 years before I was arguably the most loved man in Britain. <laughs> um, I met a guy called Paul Merrinick, who and he was comparable to J.R. in the Ewings, in that he really manipulated everything to his advantage. But unlike J.R., he never broke the law, and he never did anything that could get him into trouble. But he was an arch manipulator. And he was a bit cold, he was a bit calculating. And the bit you're referring to is the fact that he married April, and at the end of the, what turned out to be the last series, it wasn't clear how well that was going. Uh, in fact, I had married that actress myself. <laughs> and indeed, we were divorced three years later. <laughs> which was a side issue. But in terms of the programme, until recently, I hadn't known this had happened. But at a convention in England, a woman came up to me and said, Hello, I used to work for the BBC. Do you know why they stopped doing The Brothers? I said, no, she said, it's partly my fault, she said. There was a department at the BBC that allocated the budgets to programmes. And she was in the budgeting department. And they had prepared the budget for the next year from all the stuff that had been uh, collated. And they finalised it and somebody said, what about The Brothers? And there was no money left. So they said, oh well, never mind. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> no one deliberately let the store said, let's stop with the brothers. They forgot about it when they were budgeting. <laughs> and their budget was blown and all the new stuff they were doing. And I thought, not, not with a bang but a whimper. <laughs> they never told us, we just waited for the call. And it never came back. So I'll never know what happened to Paul Merrily. Or April, his wife. I'm what sorry. would you have wanted? What I wanted? Yes. Oh, a quick divorce. <laughs> there you go. All right. Everybody give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Now, we are aware that some people amongst you may have missed the opportunity of an autograph from us. So they very kindly said we can stick a table at the front outside, oh. and if any of you, you know, it's not compulsory, but just for <laughs> any of you who've gone, oh darn, we didn't go to their table, you can now. Yeah, because it's closed back there, so we didn't want you to miss that. Oh. Yay. 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 Yay.